quote, one would go mad to take the Bible seriously. But to take it seriously, one must be already mad. Alistair Crawley, founder of Felina. Two years ago, I had the pleasure of getting my hair styled at the local beauty salon. Since I was going to be there for a while, the hairstylist started a conversation with me. What started out as small talk transformed into deep philosophical questions about my faith, such as, what is the relationship between science and the Bible? And if you're confused about your gender, what do you do? I sat there frozen, my heart pounding in my chest, with nothing but the screams of the hairdryer filling the soundless void. At first, I thought she was an unbeliever who was curious about my faith, but I later discovered from my mother that she was a baby Christian who just started her relationship with God. Realizing that my, that my response could affect her newfound views, I started to think of answers to her questions if I could return. Along the way, I started to question why I believe in Christ. I mean, I grew up with Christianity, so I never really questioned it. Was it a false hope? Should I take my faith, my faith seriously? Should you take your faith seriously? <laughs> ladies, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to examine the following arguments against Christianity. Does prayer work? Why does God allow suffering? Is the Bible historically accurate? And find out if we should take our faith seriously once and for all. The first question I will address is why a good God would accede suffering. According to worldpopulationreview.com, 166,324 people die per day. If the Bible states that God is omnipotent, then he could effortlessly end suffering within the snap of his fingers. Why doesn't he? My friends, uh, the answer is right under your nose. He provided a solution for suffering a long time ago by sentencing his only son to die in our place. Through Jesus' resurrection, he unlocked the door for us into the house of heaven. But why is there still murder, crime, disease, etc. in our world? Well, unfortunately, our human ancestors chose that life for us. You see, in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve a choice to eat the forbidden fruit or avoid it. Obviously, they chose the first option, but why didn't God stop them? The answer to that is that he didn't want to infringe upon human will. Let me explain. In October 2022, my family adopted two long-haired cats. During the first few weeks of adoption, they were terribly frightened, hiding under chairs, tables, anywhere away from our sight. Back then, I was devastated. Being a student drowning in a sea of homework and tests, I thought that the image of two fluffy black cats snuggling with me would magically take my life away from life's heavy load. Of course, if I wanted love, I could have ordered one of those toy robot cats online that would be programmed to love me. The truth is that that relationship would be boring since there is no love. That's what God wants for us. He does not desire for us to be robots. Instead, he wants us to be individual people who choose whether or not we love him. That, that is why he gave Adam and Eve the choice to eat the forbidden fruit. Uh, to those of you who have been in a relationship, you know that there are some sacrifices involved. But if God is good, then why is he unresponsive to most prayers? The second criticism I'm, I'm going to address is that um, prayer never works. Have you ever prayed to pass an exam, achieve a promotion at work, or that your sports team will win, and yet those requests still go unanswered? If God really loves us, then it makes sense for him to answer the prayers of his children, right? Maybe we could pray away all the suffering in the world. I'm pretty sure that there are millions of people right now praying that their suffering would cease. Jeez. Why isn't God answering them? Is prayer pointless? Are we deceiving ourselves into thinking that our requests will be granted? 
No. Here are two cases of prayer that have defied the scientific odds. According to an NBC article published in 2015, 14-year-old John Smith was playing on the frozen St. Louis Lake in St. Charles, Missouri. The icy surface cracked and Smith slipped beneath the freezing waters, where he remained for 15 minutes. Smith fell into a coma and was quickly delivered to St. Joseph Hospital West, where the doctors applied CPR for 43 minutes, but to no avail. His mother, Joyce Smith, visited him in the hospital and prayed to God to give him back his to and, and prayed to God to give him back his heartbeat. The moment she finished, his heartbeat returned and her son was revived. Smith made a full recovery despite initial organ failure. Don't play on frozen lakes, kids. <laughs> Once upon a time, an intelligent man finally married the love of his life. Although the couple had everything they ever wanted, they longed for a child. But every time his wife got pregnant, their happiness was cut short by another miscarriage. After enduring heartbreak after heartbreak, uh, his wife prayed to God. A year later, a baby was born, kicking and screaming out of the womb. Plot twist. Baby is me. <laughs> I'm grateful that God has given me the gift of life, and I sometimes find myself wondering what it would be like if I was in another miscarriage. God does answer prayer, but why do some requests still go unanswered? Well, some religious people who are not of the Christian faith might pray to their God or God's created in, man, created in man's image. God will not answer their requests because they do not have his Holy Spirit. Just like a seed can't grow without water, it's impossible to have a relationship with God without belief in Jesus' sacrifice. Another reason why God might be unresponsive to prayer is because he wants to build strength in us. A blatant example of this would be the story of Job. God put Job through rigorous trials, and in the end, he had twice as much than he had before. Oh, but the Bible is an inaccurate source of information, since it was written by multiple people. That's what the critics would say, or is it? The third topic I will address is that the Bible is historically accurate. Uh, Cornelius Tactius, a secular Roman historian, alludes to the death of Christ of alludes to the death of Christ in Annals 15, confirming his historical existence. If Christ had not been resurrected, then where are his remains? Think about it. All those eyewitness accounts of Roman Christians being persecuted under the hand of Emperor Nero would be in vain, since their faith would be pointless. Even the church would be non-existent in the 21st in the 21st century without Christ's absent remains. Of course, there are a few few theories that attempt to explain this, such as the swoon theory, stolen body theory, and mass hallucination theory. But they have all been refuted by Christian apologists. Atheists rarely use the following arguments because they are easily defeatable. I mean the previous arguments because they're easily defeatable. I'm not I'm not intending to disrespect people of other religions, but unlike Jesus, you can go to the tombs of Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, etc., where their ashes and remains are there to this day. This makes Jesus the only this makes Jesus the only religious leader proven to be resurrected from his tomb in Jerusalem. Throughout our verbal quest in search of proof for a childlike faith, we discovered our freedom, gifted to us by the mercy of a benevolent God, the effectiveness of our prayers, which have the potential to heal broken souls and bring hope to the fatherless, and the historical accuracy of an ancient document that was thought to be in vain. I say this to Alistair Crawley, my 16-year-old self, or anyone who has doubted the foundation of our faith. The proof is right under your eyes. If you examine it further, you'll find that there is no difficulty uncovering it. 
God is knocking on your door, desiring to form a personal relationship with you. Will you answer the call? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you.